May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How many of you would say that uh, this is a motto for your life? A place for everything and everything in its place. Does that resonate with anybody here? A place for everything and everything in its place. Now, of those of you who didn't raise your hand, how many of you live with somebody with that motto? <laughs> and that makes for interesting home life, doesn't it? You know, they say that uh, in marriages, people sometimes choose their opposites to complement them. But in households, we have parents, we have children. In extended families, we have folks when it comes to planning for the next reunion at Thanksgiving or Christmas. Some folks think we got to start the day after the event for the next year. Some folks wait until the week beforehand and say, well, maybe we ought to plan something. Well, we're all wired differently. And I'd like to suggest that as we read through Scripture, we find out that God himself works in marvelous ways, both planning ahead for eternity, but also spontaneously showing up and doing things in our life. Isn't that the way it is? And if we try to figure out how God is at work, given Rissa's testimony here as well, it may be not in our timing. You know, a, a day is as, as a thousand years in God's eyes. A thousand years is one day. Somebody once went to God and said, God, I understand that things are a little bit different the way you work and that a dollar's like a million dollars or a day's like a year and... Could you give me a, a buck? And God said, yeah, just a minute. <laughs> God's timing, God's ways are not always ours. And we want to look at some texts this morning that witness to this. And we want to think about it in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. And we've already been touching about the Spirit's work in our lives and inviting God and, and praying that God would guide us by his Spirit. But do we know what we're praying for when we say those things? The Spirit shows up in ways that bewilder and confuse us many times. So I want to be having us look at Acts chapter 2, which is no new text when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. I will be highlighting a few of the verses on the screen, but not everything that I'll be touching on. And we're also going to be looking at Numbers chapter 11. Isn't the book of Numbers a wonderful book? Something that we go to on a regular basis for our devotionals because it talks about tribes and it talks about taking censuses and it talks about offerings and sacrifices, all those kinds of things that are so relevant and so practical and so inspiring. I'm a bit cynical when I say that, but you know what? If we are patient and we read through the book of Numbers, as we'll find out right in the middle, there's a gem. Not that the rest aren't, but there's a gem that speaks to this particular topic. So I want to begin with Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. If we could bring that up, please. When the day of Pentecost came, they, meaning the disciples, were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now what's not included, but I want to highlight, is the response of the crowds that were around them. Because these were the disciples, those closest to Jesus, waiting for the empowerment of the comforter that was to come after Jesus ascended. And this miraculous thing comes unexpectedly, uninvited but welcomed, anticipated in some ways because God promised an advocate that would be coming. And then we had these people listening in. And in verse 8, or I'm sorry, in verse 6, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together bewildered. The Holy Spirit shows up and people become bewildered. In verse 8, are not these men who are speaking Galileans? Now, we've got to understand, Galileans was a derogatory term. 
People from Galilee lived to the north of Jerusalem, out there in the country. They were the country folk. They were the simpletons. And the folks that are in Jerusalem right now for Pentecost, let's be reminded, Pentecost was a Jewish festival that celebrated the harvest. It was one of three pilgrimage festivals where faithful Jews would try to come to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths were the three pilgrimage festivals. The people that could come to these were people who could take time off from work and who could afford the trip. So they looked at the Galileans as simpletons. And they identified, what's going on? There's strange things. There's different languages. In fact, they're speaking in the languages of the people gathered coming in for the pilgrimage. How can these simpletons be doing this? So Galileans is not just a location. It's a stigma. And then we get down to verse 12. And the people, again, those on the outside listening in, they're amazed and they're perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. They just dismissed them as drunkards, as simpletons. And they dismissed all that was going on. But this was a miraculous event that we as a Christian church look back on and celebrate as the Lord showing up in the new way. Because in the Old Testament, the Spirit would show up, but he would show up to individuals for limited periods of time. But now the Holy Spirit was showing up for everyone to enjoy and be filled. It wasn't just a temporary kind of experience. It was an experience where we now take the Holy Spirit with us, all of us. Now hang on to this thought, because we're going to flash back to Numbers 11, if we could do that. This gem in the middle of this book of the Torah, speaking of God's activity. Now, what were the manifestations of the Holy Spirit? There were a mighty wind, there were tongues. What was the third one? Speaking in tongues, a mighty wind, and the tongues of fire. Let me just point out before I read into the center of this text. Chapter 11, verse one of Numbers, Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire came from the Lord, okay? We don't have time to go through this whole text. But then we get down to verse 31, which is after the text I want to focus on. And we hear, now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail from the sea. So what do we got? We got fire, we got wind, and the verses we're going to look at, we've got prophecy. We've got the beginnings of foreshadowing of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, right here in Numbers chapter 11. The Spirit is stirring, it's present, but it's a time-limited empowerment and anointing that we read about. Okay, we're going to begin uh, Numbers 11, beginning with verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Now the tent stands for what? It's the tent. It's the tabernacle. It's where the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence resides. And Moses is gathering together 70 leaders and elders to go to the tent Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took the spirit that was with him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. This wasn't available to everybody. This was a limited focus of the Holy Spirit on the 70 leaders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. This was a once and done. This was not a filling. This was an anointing for a time-limited purpose. Next slide. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were back with the regular people, the ordinary people. They didn't go to the tent. They didn't go to church. Are you following this? 
a young man ran and told, I'm sorry, going back to verse 26. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go to the tent. So they stayed back for whatever reason. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. The Spirit of God was not acting like the 70 prophets and Joshua thought it should be working because the elders faithfully followed Moses over to the tabernacle where God resided, right? And it was there that a special anointing took place and it was there where the prophecy was to take place. But these two Lagers were back in the camp among the ordinary people. And whatever the Spirit was doing was visited on them as well. And for some reason, they were prophesying there among the people. Who would have thought such things? Now, this is an event that took place among the nation of Israel as they were wandering the wilderness. If we'd had the time to look at chapter 11 from beginning to end, we'd find out that this was not a good time. This was like your family going on vacation for two weeks, and by the 10th day, you're really tired of each other. And you're ready to get home. You need some space. Because we read throughout here that the people are angry with God. Things were easier back in Egypt. We want the comfort, you know, they were slaves. They kind of forget. They wanted meat. That's what they're talking about here when uh, they were praying for the quail. We want, we want to go back to Egypt. And God was angry and they were upset. And in the middle of this, the very spirit shows up and creates an event to teach them. We're not going to we meaning the Trinity is not going to abandon you. We're going to continue to be with you. We're going to provide for you. Don't yearn for the days of Egypt. There are greater things to come. And this was a foretaste of the things to come. The Holy Spirit that is with you now for a moment is just a foretaste of what's to come down the road. So the Spirit of God is building bridges to the new covenant. The Spirit of God is building bridges between the leadership and the people by unleashing the prophecies that were limited, first of all, to the 70, to the other folks as well. We see a new thing taking place. We see the maturity difference between Joshua and Moses. Joshua wants to limit the benefits of being a leader to the 70 and himself. And Moses says, I'm not going to rebuke Eldad and Medad. Wish that everyone that would have the Spirit's empowerment would do the same. So God is not one we can box in. The Spirit is not one that we can limit to functioning only in certain ways. These are basic lessons of Old Testament and New Testament. Let me just highlight a few other situations in Scripture where we see God acting in interesting ways, showing up among people we wouldn't expect. In Ezra, chapter 1, verse 2, it's the beginning of the story of the people returning from exile in Persia. And of all people, King Cyrus, the Persian king, sends the people home after they had sojourned in Babylon, and then Persia conquered Babylon, and then they were there, and Syri uh, the Syrian people, Cyrus, becomes a hand of God to bring about a new way for God's people. And the people return, Ezra and Nehemiah as the leaders, to rebuild the temple. Cyrus actually provides materials for helping to rebuild the temple. An act of God among the Gentiles, among the pagans. 
In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 5 to 11, we read the story of Babylonians that were used of God to bring judgment to Israel, the northern kingdom first and later, later the, the southern kingdom, and how God worked outside of his own chosen people to bring about his purposes. The story of Pharaoh in Egypt, going back even further, and how he was there partnering with Joseph, who he appointed to take care of storing the grains during seven lean years, so there would be seven years of plenty. How Joseph's involvement not only saved the people of Egypt, but saved his own family up in Canaan when he rescued them and brought his brothers back into fellowship. God's at work through other people, through other entities outside of the chosen community. Paul himself was an educated man. When Paul would go to new places to evangelize among the Gentiles, he would use the philosophers and the poets of other people in order to build the bridges, in order to create a connection, rather than rebuke and condemn maybe the idolatry of the pagan peoples, he would note that they're on their way but haven't found the destination yet. When he was going through Athens, he saw these different idols, and he pointed out this idol to the unknown God. And Paul said, I see and perceive that you are a very religious people. And you have all these gods wanting to make sure that you don't offend anything. But it's to this unknown God that I want to reference you. And then he goes on to talk about Jesus. Rather than condemning their idol worship, he uses the religious sincerity towards evangelizing and telling them about Jesus as the one that they seek. In Acts 17, there are quotations from Greek philosophers that Paul will use to bridge the gap. In 1 Corinthians 15, he makes this allusion to the bad company, and it's actually a quote from Gentile philosophers. In Titus 1.12, he talks about the Cretans as being liars, and that was kind of one of those jokes about a certain group of people that were demeaned. Paul builds on that and says, what I am saying is one that I want to speak to you as you feel about the Cretans. God feels are part of the community of faith along with yourselves. God is always breaking down the stereotypes. God is always working outside the tabernacle, going into the camp, going directly to the people. Now, what does all this mean for us today? I want to help us draw some, some parallels. Uh, there was a phrase a while back called missional church, which was popularized, and it was a different kind of focus on mission. Rather than a group of people getting together and saying, okay, here's what we think we should be doing in our community. Here's what we think people need to be hearing. And they would do a lot of planning, they would do a lot of praying, and then they would ask God to bless their efforts and attempt to do different church growth kind of activities. And that is one honorable way of doing outreach. Missional church says we need to be more discerning as people and we need to go into our communities and try to figure out where is God already at work? Where is God already trying to make inroads with people that have a desire and have earnest yearning? They're seekers, but they don't have the full gospel, the full message. And the Spirit's already stirring in ways that might perplex us at a church. But if we would partner with people, we could do marvelous things. I want to bring out one particular example within the whole world of music. Now, musicians in our culture tend to be the philosophers and the poets of our day. And I came upon this one song, which I'm sure just about all of you are familiar with. And it's not until I started digging into it that I appreciated Maybe the stirring of the Spirit that has gone into this and how we as a church can use this as a bridge. This is just one example of how we can reach out to our neighbors using secular music as a means by which we build bridges. Now, you've probably heard of A Bridge Over Troubled Water. You know who the author of that was? Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel. Now, I think they both grew up Jewish. I don't know if... They're practicing Jews, 
But there's the story behind this song that I found kind of amazing. Simon, uh, Paul Simon, loved gospel music. He would listen to it all the time. And there was one particular group that he came across that he was just totally amazed with. And they were the swan tones, the swan tones. And they brought up a song entitled, Mary, Don't You Weep. This song goes back to pre-Civil War era. It was a Negro spiritual. And one of the phrases in this song was, I'll be your bridge over water if you trust in my name. That was from the spiritual pre-Civil War that was brought back by the silver tones, the swan silver tones in about the 60s or so. Paul Simon heard this and he was moved by it. He took that song and built this, what some have said is a secular hymn about a bridge over troubled water. Let me read for you the first verse of this. And again, this is a takeoff on the original song. The original song talked about how God rescued the Hebrews from Pharaoh, and then later into the New Testament, the words of Mary, don't you weep, is to bring comfort to Mary in her time of grief. That being the troubled water that Paul Simon picked up with. When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'm on your side. Oh, I'm on your side. When times get rough and friends just can't be found. You can kind of feel the spiritual nature behind it. There's, there's a yearning. There's a desire for healing and restoration. And then the chorus says, Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Well, there's some other interesting stories that are connected to this. Another group, a Christian group called Sammy Hall Singers, picked up on this song and said, you know what? It just, this speaks to the culture. This was number one for like eight or nine weeks on the charts. This speaks to our culture. We just need to build on it and let people know that there is one who will calm the troubled waters in your life. And they took the chorus and wrote, like a bridge over troubled water, Jesus can be found. Like a bridge over troubled water, yes, he can be found. And for a lot of people, Jesus is the missing link in their life. Jesus is the link that makes life tolerable now and gives purpose even to the challenges that we face for the future. Verse 2 reads, when you're down and out, when you're on the street, when evening falls so hard, I will comfort you. I'll take your part when darkness comes and pain is all around. And then the chorus again from the Sammy Hall singers, like a bridge over troubled water, Jesus can be found. Like a bridge over troubled water, yes, he can be found. If you want more about this story, he was actually interviewed, Paul Simon, by Dick Cavett. Now, those of you <laughs> uh, in your 60s and above might remember that name. He was a talk show host. And he interviewed Paul Simon. And in that story, Paul says, you know, this, this song came to me, this, these lyrics came to me like no other. It usually took me weeks and weeks to write a song. This one came to me immediately. It was like something outside of me was doing the work. He never mentioned anything spiritual, but in his own way, he was saying, I don't know where this came from, but it didn't come from me. This was too good for me. So he was acknowledging that this came from uh, what we would say was a spirit of God <laughs> uh, without him even knowing it. And he was able to speak into his culture about the yearning that our people face. And others have come along and supplemented his words and say, yes. Yes, this is the yearning for all of us Christians as well. And Jesus is the answer. Jesus can be found. Paul Simon once said of this hymn, it's just a humble little gospel song. He recognized it was good news. And he was this close. And maybe he's made that leap, I don't know. 
But for me, it's an inspiration of how the Spirit of God works and how we need to be recognizing that the Spirit is working outside of the tabernacle, how Jesus is working in the camps, and he wants us to go to the camps. But we need to build bridges over the troubled waters that people are facing. We need to help simply fill in the blanks and say, your yearning is also my yearning. I'm no different than you than a follower of Jesus. My only difference is I've been forgiven and that I have found the answer to which these songs yearn. So the song has been a bridge between Christian culture and secular culture. Jesus is the bridge between the tabernacle and the camp, the people. And my friends, I'm calling on each one of us to be the bridge, to look where the Spirit's at work around us and say, how can I partner with others doing well and simply bring my presence and my message of hope into those situations? Amen.